Okay. Oh God. Okay. <sighs> okay. Admit them, CJ. Kavina. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, you're gonna. I'm gonna make you right now a host, co-host, and you're gonna admit everyone. And I'm gonna okay. actually stop the recording. Right. Pause it. Hi, Hi. everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce our host, our wonderful Miss Kavina. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lecture on Asian American art. We have our guest speakers here today, uh, Dr. Mark Johnson and Dr. Suzette Min. Now, before we get started, Julian will be highlighting the Asian American Studies major and our no minor and then our future major. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Julian Hang. I, will, I am here. I'm a senior here at uh, CSU Fresno. I'm a theater arts major with a minor in Asian American Studies, um, or ACM. And ACM minor is an excellent choice for all students. As a it has a requirement of six three-unit classes for a total of 18 units. Um, ACM is always relevant and is an increasingly demanded subject at all levels of standard workforce and corporate echelons. Um, as we move forward towards a more unified global understanding and acceptance of each other, especially here in the United States um, and all around the globe, CSU Fresno is looking to achieve something historical here in the coming months. Um, the Central Valley's very first Asian American Studies majors program. The major is not set in stone. Um, we're definitely pushing it. But we are projecting spring to uh, 2025 or fall 2025. Uh, please be on the lookout for it. It's going to be a major change here in Central Valley. It's going to be wonderful. The major is projected to only require two additional uh, three-unit classes from the minor. This will definitely allow for many students to attain a double major. Um, if you haven't yet, please consider... Uh, ACM as a pathway for your future because I mean you could be the bridge for your future um, you could be the bridge to connect Asian American studies you know to the world um, and most importantly to share and spread Asian jo joy and Asian love thank you and if you have any questions please con um, consult Dr. Bond she is you know the foremost expert on this uh, Asian American studies major thank you Thank you very much, Julian. And now, as you have seen in the chat, CJ will be monitoring, monitoring the chat, so please keep any dialogue respectful. Also, since we will be filming this, if you don't give consent to yourself being recorded, feel free to turn off your camera now at this moment. And now we will get started. So I have a very distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Mark Johnson, who is a professor at San Francisco State University. And he was educated at Yale University, where he was a personal assistant to Joseph Albers and received his MFA at UC Berkeley. He previously was a professor at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California, and associate dean of academic affairs at the San Francisco Art Institute. His publications include Asian American Art, a History, 1850 to 1970, and At Work, the Art of California Labor. All right, and uh, Dr. Johnson, you can now share your screen. Okay, uh, one moment while I make that happen. And I'm just gonna confirm that this is viewable for everyone. Is that the case? Yes. Okay, uh, so first I wanna thank everyone at CSU Fresno for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, and I also wanna recognize that I'm honored to uh, participate on today's panel with Suzette Min. Uh, my name is Mark Johnson, as you've heard. I've been a professor at two CSU campuses, Humboldt and San Francisco State. And today I'd like to talk about two things. First, how I came to be involved with Asian American art history, and then to present a brief historical survey of about a century of art and to mention about 30 artists. Although I will speak about historical artists, I also want to acknowledge contemporary artists of Asian ancestry, including Jamie Nakagawa Boley, 
who I have never met and whose paintings I have never seen in person, but who has a long history with CSU Fresno and whose work I greatly admire. Uh, so if anyone sees her, please tell her I uh, tried to give her a shout out. Uh, I titled my presentation, Polycentrism, the Net of Indra, as a way to underscore that there is no one kind of Asian American art or artist. My inspiring colleague, Professor Margo Machida, uses the term polycentric to describe her research, evoking a world of many centers of power and importance. And I think that suggests a way to think about the diversity of Asian American art and artists. And now I wanna just mention something about uh, polycentrism and the net of Indra. In the Vedic tradition of almost 2000 years ago, the net of Indra was envisioned as a metaphor to suggest a world of interconnectivity that would come to be associated with Buddhism. Interwoven threads hang overhead in the sky and multifaceted jewels are suspended like stars at each of their intersections. These in turn reflect every other jewel to tie together myriad locations and outlooks. This polycentric perspective reflects the diverse backgrounds of Asian American artists of different generations that I hope to discuss today. My own engagement with the field began in the late 1980s when I was involved in the multicultural activism centered at the San Francisco Art Institute where I was associate dean. The school hosted an extended series of public symposia largely conceptualized by Filipino American painting faculty, Carlos Villa, entitled Worlds in Collision, Sources of a Distinct Majority, it brought together contemporary artists, critics, and art historians who were interested in advocating for greater ethnic cultural representation and narratives of American art. In this slide, we see two works by Carlos Villa from the early 1970s. On the left, he had a student take a photograph of him on the campus of the school and then drew tattoo patterns on it that he imagined. And on the right, uh, he worked with an airbrush to create these swirling patterns and then attach feathers and called the piece, My Roots. Carlos Villa's late 1980s symposia grew out of his own artistic commitment to multicultural actions that included curating a 1976 exhibition that helped articulate what he called third world consciousness in the arts. An important coalition of intellectuals came together in the late 1980s to plan the next symposia series. These included Marxist scholar, Dr. Angela Davis, artist and Chicana educator, Dr. Amalia Mesa Baines, and art historian, Moira Roth. In 1989, I participated in a planning meeting about developing a summer conference focused on expanding American art history to reflect multi-ethnic diversity that would host lectures and build a bibliography about the contributions from four underrepresented communities that were conceptualized as African-American, Asian-American, Latino, and Native American. It was intended for a select group of academics, teachers, to support rethinking how they taught American art history curriculum. And it featured responses from beloved cultural critic, Bell Hooks. We discussed the need for more archive-focused art historical research. And that research became the focus of several exhibitions that I helped organize after I joined the faculty at San Francisco State, a university that has long been at the forefront of Asian American studies within a college of ethnic studies that was founded in 1969 and largely envisioned by Chinese poetry scholar Kai Yu Shu. 35 years later, it becomes clear that this conference was a fulcrum in my own involvement with multi multiple projects that focused on Asian American art history. At that first program in 1989 and 1992, people said, well, we really don't know much about the historical story that happens before 1970. So that's what I wanna talk about today. This is why I began working in the field to document the careers of artists of Asian ancestry. They slipped through the cracks of history because immigrants from Asia were not eligible for US citizenship until the mid 20th century. And so perhaps they were not even considered American. And because their work was often stylistically different from mainstream American artists, and especially because they were excluded 
by racist attitudes and the way that museums reflect the tastes of the wealthy who collect European American artists. There have been thousands of forgotten Asian American artists over the past 150 years, and their work has been waiting for us to remember them. An important backdrop for my remarks today is the horrific history of American racism toward persons of Asian ancestry. I won't spend any time today discussing that topic, but instead refer you to a Stanford University webpage that documents some instances of racist attacks and murders, and also unfair legis legislation that specifically targeted people from Asian backgrounds and made their lives and careers difficult. I also won't talk about how American immigration policy led to different waves of immigration, beginning first with the Chinese in the mid 19th century, then the Japanese in the late 19th century, then Filipino in the early 20th century, then more Korean American immigration after World War II, and people from Southeast Asia after the 1965 Immigration Act and the Vietnam War. Because my presentation is historical, however, it is important to note that I will largely be speaking primarily about artists of Chinese and Japanese ancestry, and that the story became much more complicated after the 1965 Immigration Act. So today I'm going to present a quick introduction to a few historical artists. I'll begin in the late 19, excuse me, begin in the late 1860s and talk about artists over a period of roughly a century. According to a survey conducted by the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association or Chinese Six Companies, there were 16 professional artists and photographers working in San Francisco in 1869. One artist represented in that 1869 census was Lai Yang, a highly successful photographer, portrait painter, and public intellectual during the 1860s and 1870s. Here are two rare self-portrait photographs of the artists showing him working on a painting and two examples of his painted portraiture. The 1870 portrait of Adolf Sutro, uh, which you can see on the bottom in the elliptical frame, confirms that Lai was among the most accomplished portrait painters of the 19th century in San Francisco. It is rich in vitality and exquisitely glazed. His 1876 portrait of Edwin Crocker at the top proves that Lai used photographs as his source, and as Crocker had died a year earlier than this painted portrait, and he looked quite a bit older than he appears in the painting. But what makes Lai especially interesting today is his role as the author of an angry of angry remarks criticizing American foreign policy toward China, as well as our unfair treatment of Chinese in America. These remarks were first delivered to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 1873 and then published as a pamphlet in 1874 and reprinted in the New York Times. Lai used his position and platform as a respected artist with special access to the politically powerful to speak as a public intellectual for cultural equity most successful Asian artist from the late 19th century was a Japanese immigrant painter named Toshio Aoki, who worked in a Japanese style called Nihonga, Japanese Nihong and Gamini style, that exemplifies late 19th century engagement with Japonisma, the interest in Japanese aesthetics in Europe and America that was a key spark for their the interest in modernist approaches in Western art. An example of his work is shown here uh, and you can maybe see there's a reclining figure in a sort of green robe uh, that is Jean Cui, Lord of the Demons. I know it's hard to see, uh, but Jean Cui is reclined in the underwear, covered with demons like Gulliver and the Lilliputians. The painting was mounted in America using an unconventional batik fabric. Aoki worked first in San Francisco and later in Pasadena, and his work depicts deities, as you see on the right, like the painting of Zhang Yi riding on the back of a bat to her new home in the moon. Works by Toshio Aoki are used in Seshu Hayakawa's 1919 silent film, The Dragon Painter, that was based on a Mary Fenollosa novel, 
And the film starred Aoki's daughter, Tsuruko Aoki, as well as Hayakawa. Turn of the century, Turn of the 20th century, pioneer photographer Frank Matsura was the subject of a monograph published by the Washington State Okanagan County Historical Society. His self-portrait series on the left and portrait of a girl on the right gives some idea of his fun-loving individualistic personality. Matsura's fresh photographs of Native Americans stand in marked contrast to the staged romantic images that Edward Curtis photographed from the same period. A few years later, Japanese American art photography was important in cities, including San Francisco, Honolulu, uh, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Dennis Reed has written that, quote, no other photographic collective from a single nation attained the level of artistic accomplishment and influence achieved by the group of Japanese Americans working in Los Angeles, unquote. Works like these by Japanese art photographers include Shigemi Uyeda's 1925 Reflections on an Oil Ditch and Kiromu Kira's 1930 Curves. These work demonstrate the transformation of pictorialist to modernist photography and suggest why this community was so important to famous photographers like Edward Weston and Ansel Adams. There were many art clubs so the artists were supporting themselves. Uh, right now in, in Berkeley, there's a wonderful show of the Asian American Women Artists Association, which is a contemporary example of those kind of art clubs, but they've been around for more than a hundred years. Um, and this is an example. San Francisco 1920s art clubs included the multi-ethnic East West Art Society. They even met, mounted an exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Art in 1922. Obata's 1913 Mother Earth on the left is a masterpiece of what I call California Nihonga. It was inspired by the first pregnancy of his wife Haruko. And then on the right, his setting sun in the Sacramento Valley is an 11 foot tall hanging scroll that was displayed at the California Palace of the Legion of Honor in 1925 and gives a hint about Obata's relationship with the Bay Area's budding environmentalist movement. But other artists of that group were also inspiring. Several were Japanese American, like the artists you see on this slide, uh, Spider of Dawn on the left, uh, the wings on the right and a portrait of Carmel uh, in the center and a portrait of Carmel on the right uh, are all, I think in any generation they'd be considered inspiring and they in developed innovative approaches to landscape the Kotaku Spider of Dawn, that's uh, Mount Tam behind the figure, uh, but also some were Chinese American like Chichen S. Chung Li, who also exhibited with the same group. So it was a pan Asian group. He developed innovative nature iconography that suggested the living essence of the earth. If you look at the cliff face, you can see that there are uh, human figures embedded in the cliffs. Uh, and this piece, is now maybe moving to the Smithsonian. So we're very excited about that after being really hidden away for a very long time. In my opinion, this is some of the best art produced in California during this period. At the same time in New York, Yasuo Kuniyoshi had become well known and successful for his works that seemed to reference American folk art, like these cows on the farm on the left. Kuniyoshi was best known, was the best known early Asian American artist in New York, the first Asian ancestry artist to have a show at the Whitney Museum, but he was not the only one. Politically oriented Itaro Ishigaki, whose work you see on the right, the bonus march where the military uh, shot down veterans who were protesting was another. But ultimately Ishigaki was deported as a communist and his work was never seen in the United States again. Also in the 1920s, Chinese Americans were involved in other art collectives that were sometimes multi-ethnic. Here are two, Yan Ji on the right in San Francisco founded a Chinese revolutionary artist club that extolled modernist approaches beginning in 1926. His cubist influenced self-portrait, Where Is My Mother? is a reminder of the Chinese Exclusion Act that often separated families. Tyrus Wong self-portrait on the left also 
sometimes exhibited with an artist collective, but he is best known for his work in Hollywood, including his inspiring designs for the 1940 Disney film, Bambi. Don Kingman became the best known Chinese person in America and his work in watercolor gained recognition beginning in the 1930s was very influential. Here we see on the left Kingman's depiction of the elevated train tracks in New York and on the right, his view of Grant Avenue in San Francisco's Chinatown. Kingman also became successful in Hollywood working on films including Flower Drum Song, the first Hollywood film with an Asian American majority cast. In the 1940s, World War II changed the political dynamic of the world and Zhang Shuxi came to the United States from China as an ambassador. His messengers of world peace that included a depiction of 100 doves was presented to Franklin Roosevelt and hung in the White House. Uh, and his son is Gordon Chang, who we were speaking about at the beginning of this, uh, before we turned on the recording. Also in the 1940s, Mexican artist Diego Rivera was very influential and he created several murals in California. In this short clip, which I'm gonna see if I can pay now, play now, there he is at work um, on his masterpiece for the Golden Gate International Exhibition. If you watch closely at the end, you can get a glimpse of his assistant wearing a yellow jumpsuit and that's Mine Okubo. Mine, there she is, uh, just about to appear. Uh, she was doing demonstration fresco work uh, and answering questions while Diego was work up, working up on the scaffolding. Mini Akubo was one of the 120,000 Japanese Americans who were interned in concentration camps during the war. And she kept a journal of her experience that was published as Citizen 13660. And her painting of a dust storm that she created while she was interned is a masterpiece that suggests how the winds of war were so disruptive. After the war, there was a power, powerful shift in the interest of the art world toward abstraction. Ruben Tam is an artist who was born in Hawaii, but spent the majority of his career on the East Coast, showing alongside Yasuo Kuniyoshi at the Downtown Gallery in New York for many years. His work was even photographed and he was documented and planned for an inclusion in a big magazine article in Life Magazine, which was the biggest magazine of the time. And the article was about the most exciting artists of that period. And he was the only Asian American included, but his work was dropped out just before publication. During the early years of abstraction, surrealism was an important influence. In the work of Filipino American artist, Alfonso Osorio, we can sense that energy of surrealism on the abstract forms that animate this work. Osorio became a close friend of some of the most famous abstract artists like Jackson Pollock, and that friendship has almost overshadowed his own reputation. The most famous historical Asian American artist who even has a museum dedicated to his work in New York is Isamo Noguchi. And you get a little bit of a sense of his work here. He worked in stone, he worked in ceramic, as you see that mask and wood. And then the piece on the right is carved from driftwood. That piece is entitled My Pacific. He was conceptualized and he made drawings for it during his internment in New Mexico, but uh, completed in New York after his release. San Francisco artist Ruth Asawa had studied at Black Mountain College with Bauhaus refugee Joseph Albers from Germany, and she had hoped to become a teacher. She traveled to Mexico with a Quaker group and learned to weave with wire. After being interned, she learned that no school would hire someone of Japanese ancestry right after the war. So she decided to become an artist instead and moved to San Francisco. There she became very involved with we crocheting these incredible polymorphic abstract uh, sculpture in wire and also with art education. There's an arts high school here now named after her. Another woman, oh, well, let me see if I can start this before we move forward. I wanted to introduce Ruth. So here's a film clip. And this is from a show we did with her at San Francisco State in 1997. So you get to hear and see what she looked like as a mature artist in her later years. Oh, sorry. 
mistake. I was working on one and I went up here and I didn't like the shape that was happening, so I decided I'd cut it. And as I cut it, it spread the weight of that stretch like this. And then and I got cut more, the stretch became wider. And I decided, oh, I kind of like that. So I decided, well, I tried to figure out how to do that delivery. So that's the result of this one. It came out in this way. So I began to work on open one of these things. I just started that one. And I just started that one. So I just started a variation to new sculpture. And then one one sculpture I just was in Sonoma, a home in Sonoma, and a little bird came in and built a nest. What we saw right there, and the, the laid egg, and the bird grew, and then they flew out out of the little hole that was in the window. But I take I I can do a, a certain amount, and my fingers get. Hard, so it's a it's over a period of time, but if you were to condense it, I could probably do it in a very short time. It's like knitting a, a crocheting or knitting a, a napkin or a sweater. The same difference. The only thing is that I'm using uh, wires and yarn. <laughs> No, no, it I use I use a wire that's malleable, soft. I started using when I first started, I started with serious heavy wire. And then I then over the period of years I I found other metal. I mean any other wire that was there. So I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit and meeting Ruth Asala in person. She is a wonderful person uh, who's now getting uh, wonderful and much deserved attention. Another important woman artist who achieved a high profile during the same period was Tsang Yuho. Uh, she moved to Hawaii in 1949, but often exhibited in New York and visited California many times. She worked with collage and sometimes included seaweed in her amazing and gorgeous constructions. Many Hawaii artists are not at all well known on the mainland. I think she is one of the greatest. After the immigration laws changed in 1965, many artists relocated to the United States. One of the most famous Chinese painters of the 20th century was one of them. His name is Zhang Da Qian, spelled in different ways, but this is how the artist himself stated, spelled it. And he lived in Carmel and Pebble Beach. Here we see his colorful depictions of Yosemite's El Capitan at sunset in the autumn in the center and in the heat of summer on the right. He wore a beard and Chinese robes. And I also wanted to show a little bit of him. I'm just gonna play this for a minute so you get a sense of. California is the home to one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. If Picasso had lived here, everybody would know. Zhang Da Chen lived here, everybody should. Uh, Love this tree, uh, painted it many times. It just grew out of the sand. Uh, 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 and that's what I'm going to share from him today. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to say I'm almost at the end here. In the late 1960s, a new generation of artists appeared. I just wanted to mention a few. Nanjun Pike was an international artist who worked in Europe, in Europe as well as the United States. Here's an image of a wonderful performance where he dipped his head into a bucket of ink to draw with his hair. 
He's one of the greatest innovators in using video technology in his work. In 1969, he created a video costume that was worn by cellist Charlotte Mormon, what became a famous work of video art. And uh, in the early 70s, created a installation where he focused a video camera on a Buddhist sculpture to question the intersection of spirituality and technology. And I'm gonna to end today by just mentioning briefly Martin Wong, who's pretty wild, who went to Humboldt. So I met him because uh, he was an alumnus of Humboldt State. Uh, he made these crazy paintings like the Tibetan quirky pig eating watermelon to kind of query issues of stereotype. Um, I recently, uh, and he, you can see the Scarry Night, which is about uh, Vincent van Gogh cutting off his ear, but done in kind of a faux Chinese calligraphy style and he wrote poems in his ceramics. Uh, I was gonna say, I just recently um, co-edited a uh, something called a catalog resume, which is documentation of every painting that this guy made. Um, and it's also available on Stanford University's uh, library website. I'm gonna show just a few seconds of Martin, which is going to be in this, because one of the things Martin did was when he lived in California is he worked for a kind of a, I don't know, new age uh, gender bending theater group called the Angels of Light Free Theater. And he did sets, but this gives you a sense of how wild some of that was. And so again, he did the sets in the back. There he is, there's Martin. Uh, but, you know, this was this crazy performance called Peking on Acid, and he did that set, and the choreographer or set uh, costume designer Beaver Bowers dressed as a frog, he did these skulls and bunnies, and he's got the little kids moving them back and forth. He said it was like target practice. Um, so that just takes you up to, again, uh, about a hundred year survey of uh, Asian American art from California. So I'm going to stop share there and just say um, my colleague, Gordon Chang, who I mentioned earlier, um, once wrote that one day perhaps people will remember the contribution of Asian American artists as integral to the fabric of American culture in a similar way that African American musicians are recognized for their preeminent role in American music. There have been so many more that are deserving of recognitions and study. I hope you agree with me that any survey of American art and culture needs to prominently feature this incredibly rich history of Asian American art and artists. And I urge all of you to join with us to help celebrate their beautiful contribution. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson, for your wonderful talk. You highlighted a great variety of artists and different styles. And I really like that quote at the end. As you said, these are people that we should know. But unfortunately, historically, they've been excluded from the conversations. And now I have the distinct pleasure of also introducing Dr. Suzette Min, who is the Associate Professor and Department Chair of Asian American Studies at UC Davis. Now, she received her PhD from Brown University, and before that, she was at the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University and was Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at the Drawing Center in New York City. Now, Min was a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of English at Pomona College. Her research interests include Asian American literature, ethnic American literature, Asian American art, contemporary art, and visual culture. And Dr. Min, feel free to share your screen for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, for organizing this. Thank you, Kavina, for everything, um, and Sujay for managing the chat. Um, and thank you all for just sharing the space with us tonight. Um, it's an honor and joy to be in conversation with you all and Mark um, to talk about Asian American art and, and visual culture. And I wish you the best of luck in approving the Asian American Studies major and to get it approved as soon as possible. I think that's fantastic. That's right on the verge of happening. Um, I'm currently speaking from Oakland, California, um, also, known, also known as Ohlone Land, where generations of people um, actively stewarded these lands to ensure they provided for all living things. I want to acknowledge the impact colonization had on the Moaka Nation and recognize my responsibility, especially as a seller of color, 
to help them heal from this history and secure sustainable future. While I'm aware that land acknowledgement statements can be seen as facile, I hope to circle back to the land and the role Asian American art can play in matters of sovereignty and stewardship. Oops, sorry about that. So as you notice, I have this eye patch on my eye and I'm not supposed to be looking at the computer or reading anything every 20 minutes. So I hope that doesn't go back on, but um, I am gonna turn off my screen and share my uh, share my slides if you don't mind, because I'm basically using this um, magnifying glass in order for me to see the words. I'm losing vision in my left eye and so hence why I have this patch. Um, so, I am a scholar, I'm a curator, I'm a teacher, and um, I'm, you know, as Kavina mentioned, I'm currently chair of Asian American Studies at UC Davis, where I work with an amazing staff, including Jenny's daughter, Alex. Um, my research, pedagogy, and exhibition making are multidisciplinary, comparative, and relational, with attention centered on cultural productions, especially modern and contemporary art, in relation to the intersectionalities of race, sex, sorry, race, sex, gender, um, and class in local and global contexts. And so, um, you know, in all my work, I hope to foster, you know, on the page, in the classroom, in the exhibitionary space, thought-provoking dialogue that engages readers, viewers, and students in ways that open up a topic or complicate it um, in order to set up the conditions for a politics to occur. And I've also consistently promoted and or curated art of underrepresented and underrecognized artists, especially Asian American artists. And note, I am gonna talk about Asian American art from the point of view of a curator and a scholar, not as a practitioner. And a curator, you know, is not just someone who selects and displays objects, but multitasks. And I'd like to see the curator is also a cultural producer who makes meaning and in turn produces knowledge by way of the work selected um, in, a, you know, in terms of also display, playing with lighting, the color of the walls and writing the wall text. So what I wanna emphasize is that cur curators do not just only pick works, but they frame them. And they're not just playing, placing a frame around a picture, but they're really creating conceptual framework that informs how you will see the work, how you will approach the work in a particular kind of way. Okay. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, like right. Need to unmute. Okay, and share my screen. Okay. So it's been interesting over the last year to view art with one eye, especially after the surgery that I had last month where I saw nothing. And then I saw some blobs and blurs and now shapes and forms. And it's been a wild ride, especially as I've been um, reviewing R-E hyphen V-I-E-W-I-N-G over the last two years, Asian American contemporary art in relation to an upcoming exhibition I'm co-curating with Amy Sadow and realizing the sort of missteps I've made and also misdevelopments and aspects around Asian American art since one way or another, an exhibition I curated in 2006 with Melissa Chu and the late Karen Higa. So one way or another was in part an exhibition to check the pulse of Asian American contemporary art at the time. And it was motivated by an impulse to open up the parameters of what Asian American art is and does um, and it included 17 artists, Asian American artists from across the United States, except for Hawaii. And I can talk more about this exhibition during the Q&A, but the time it was, it was really a response to Margo Machida's groundbreaking exhibition, Asian America, um, which was the first major Asian American art, first major Asian American art exhibition in a museum. Um, at the time in 2006, I felt really good about curating the show as it was well received for the most part and seemed to break the binds of identity politics as the exhibition, um, according to one critic, described the exhibition as, quote, freeing Asian American art from itself, end of quote. And at the time, I thought, OK, that's fantastic. But now, you know, I, uh, you know, I was thinking, what does that mean? And put another way, how has, you know, the meaning or how have the meanings of freedom and liberation changed alongside the intensification of global capitalism and neoliberalism? 
So tonight I want to share with you some thoughts on the shift and my response in combination with some artist responses in the form of refusal. And to conclude with some thoughts, some next steps, uh, future pathways. But in order to do that, I need to give a, you know, define some working terms, um, offer some backstory, beginning with the question of what is Asian American art? What does it do? So for many, Asian American art has been and continues to be conceived simply as art created by an artist of Asian American descent or misperceived as Asian, Asian art or presumed to contain some kind of Asian looking motif, design or symbol. Categorizing art made by a person of Asian descent is already complicated, as you know. A person who identifies or is marked as Asian American is part of a growing heterogeneous constituency differentiated by ethnicity with many born here and others coming from more than 45 different countries as babies, young adults, college students as undocumented or legal immigrants or refugees with diverse class and religious backgrounds and political inclinations. Many Asian Americans arrive in the States in pursuit of the American dream or for other economic opportunities, but many are here because we, the United States, were over there as part of the legacies of colonialism, imperialism, racial capitalism, and war. So returning to the parsing of what is Asian American art, much of Asian American art has been and is still perceived as Asian art or presumed to sort of contain some sort of kind of, you know, Asian looking motif designer symbol. As noted in the introduction of Mark Johnson and Daniel Cornell's exhibition catalog, Asian American Modern Art, Shifting Currents, Asian American art is too often miscategorized at the get-go by registrars, marginalized and forgotten in the storage rooms of many museums, or deacquisitioned um, as without value based on the speculations of a volatile art market. Only recently, has Asian American art been recognized as having a history, a really long history as Mark has just shown us, beginning with the arrival of Asian Americans in the US in the 1900s. But despite this long history of Asian American artistic production within the United States and transnationally, Asian American artists and their artworks have been and continue to be underrepresented and overlooked case in point, Ruth Asawa, who is now hailed as this brilliant, beautiful artist but prior to her belated international recognition, her gorgeous luminous hanging wall sculp wire sculptures made of overlapping loops and circles were dismissed or read narrowly as decorative and domestic craft objects. And then there's Teresa Hakyang Cha, who in 2022 was finally recognized by the New York Times in a very belated obituary. She died in 1982. She not only wrote the award-winning, you know, or not award-winning, it was this really well-received, very important text called Dicte, but she also did a number of performances and video works that are, and the archive, by the way, is at the Berkeley Art Museum, but she was also belatedly recognized. It is no doubt nice to see that a number of Asian American artists are finally being recognized as, you know, someone to be remembered and their artworks to be collected by major museums and blue chip galleries. These artists are no doubt deserving of mainstream and art historical recognition. Their artworks should be acquired, preserved, and displayed in ways that place them in legitimate art historical lineage. But what are the implications of being recognized as such? And why does Asian American art always seem to be arriving? What kind of art is being recognized and what kind of art is specifically being collected now? How are museums framing Asian American art? As multi, sort of a multicultural phenomenon, as part of a DEI initiative, as part of the American fabric, as shallow gestures of liberal guilt and political correctness, or is it all about identity and anti-Asian violence? One can make a very persuasive case that the art world has not only recognized Asian American art, but embraced it, with Asian American artists included in the current Britney Biennial 2024, even better than the real thing, which is currently up now and includes Jess Fan, Yasmin Alan Huang, Lotus Lori Kong, who is shown here, um, Diane Severn Yuen, Takako Yamaguchi. There's a dynamic group show that's showing in Los Angeles, Here's Diane, Diane Severin Nguyen. There's a dynamic show um, called Scratching the Moon that is currently in Los Angeles, curated by artist Anna Suhoi. There's the Place Show at ICA um, in San Jose, which includes a number of Bay Area artists, including Weston Teruya, Valerie So, Stephanie Sujiko, and Christy Chan. 
And if you go to New York, there's currently a major solo exhibition of Toshiko Takezu. Um, and you can see her gorgeous ceramics at the Isama Noguchi Museum. And in the fall, Carl Chang has a survey show in Austin. Howie Chen has a major exhibition of Asian American artists on the East Coast. And I think there's an amazing group of Japanese American artists right now, including Hisako Hibi at the Monterey Art Museum. And I'm sure there are a number of other um, uh, you know, exhibitions that I'm missing. The major showcase of Asian American art currently in major cities in the US just didn't happen yesterday, but is due to the efforts of many, including actions by Asian American artists from Kearney Street Workshop and Godzilla to curators such as Margot Machida and Mark Johnson and the powerful duo of Marcy Kwan and Elisa Pichamarn Alexander, who recently inaugurated several years ago, the Asian American Arts Initiative at the Kansas Museum at Stanford, in which Jerry Yang, who is the founder of Yahoo, and hopefully others have pledged millions of dollars to collect and preserve Asian American art. But if we were to collectively do an exercise right now and make a list of Asian American artists, could you name five artists and at least one work by each of them? I really hope you do, and I, I bet you can. Um, but if you can't, that's okay. As many students and many people in art history, museums, in their art world, and even in Asian American studies would not be able to do that. Note, next week is the Association of Asian American Studies Conference. A decade ago, there were just one or two panels on Asian American art. Now there are so many more and more scholars in Asian American studies are expanding the discursive formation of Asian Americans by way of, their, by way of their rigorous analysis of empire and racial capitalism, queer diasporas and utopias, including, you know, and they're just really um, tackling these really tough themes and topics and um, engaging with Asian, a work by Asian American artists. But returning our attention back to the exhibitionary space and Asian American art. The recognition and display of Asian American art could be described as coming in different stages or waves, and I forgot to put a slide here. But the first wave, and I want to say, was mid 19, the sort of 1990s. Next would be the mid 2000s when I curated a, uh, one way or another in 2006. And now um, I think we're in a current wave that arguably began after the Atlanta spa murders in 2021. Note, that doesn't mean Asian American art wasn't being made or displayed. As Mark has pointed out, Asian Americans have been making art since their arrival from Angel Island to the Bay Area and in the 1950s and 1960s when Asian American artists were collected in major museums. In the 1970s, Asian American artists were not only making art in their studios, but with the community, as in the case of Tomi Arai, who is pictured here, and her involvement with the Asian Basement Workshop and Godzilla. And in the 1980s, they were active in creating alternative spaces in responding to the AIDS crisis. And this is Martin Wong, who um, Mark uh, ended with in his presentation. I believe that this current wave of Asian American art places Asian American art in a very good place. Um, that's not, but I, and I think it's not just because, you know, a lot of these Asian American artists are now recognized by the market or they're being placed in the canon. Um, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think they're in a good place, but I'm also wary. Um, I mean, the situation, I don't know, I'm not exactly, I mean, it'd be interesting. I, I wanna hear what, you know, um, what kind of films you've been talking about um, and discussing, but it's kind of similar to um, the situation in film. So like after Chris, you know, there's Crazy Rich Asians, Minari, everything, everywhere, all at once, past lives and joyride. You know, they have this cast of Asian Americans and, you know, we're, you know, we're in, who have very compl complicated um, storylines and rich characterizations. And I hope to see more kinds of films with Asian Americans and all kinds of stories playing a wide array of, again, deep and complicated roles. And I hope so too, in the context of Asian American art, that this will also happen, but usually waves fall short. And then there's a long dry spell, or they seem after the fact that, you know, the um, sort of spate or of, of um, Asian American film, and or in this case, Asian American art, it's kind of like a feel good corrective after years of underrepresentation and misrepresentation. But I'm hoping to see this current wave as a phase, a distinct period or stage um, that's about really transformative change. 
I am though a pessimist sometimes. Um, and I'm not going to share with you the details of, you know, we can talk about racism, exclusion, Orientalism, xenophobia, and all that of why Asian American art continues to be marginalized. But I want to just sort of um, share with you my, my hesitation and then end the talk with why I think we're truly in a good place and, you know, sort of mess things up. So, um, it, you know, after I curated one way or another, it was 2006. And then, you know, there were the Atlanta spawn murders and there was this spate of, um, you know, a rise of, again, anti-Asian violence. And then all of a sudden the art world seemed to pay attention like, oh yeah, there are Asian American art, art artists there. there. We should have an Asian American art show. And I feel like despite the emergence of a cosmopolitan and diverse global art scene, Asian American art remains tokenized or separated or segregated from other kinds of modern and contemporary and BIPOC art. Um, and the inclusion of a lot of Asian American artists, again, is tremendous. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. But sometimes I just wonder the incentive and motive and sustainability. And these kinds of actions basically make the museum and the art world appear benevolent and open-minded, keeping up with the times, enriching a global, a growing global audience. So unnameable, the ends of Asian American art was primarily a plea to pause, but really to resist this acceptance of, um, of liberal institutional recognition, or rather its terms, and to take the time to review what Asian American art is and does, and reset the categorical imperatives of Asian American art. In the same spirit of the Godzilla and Kennedy Street Workshop um, and their efforts in advocating for visibility and representation of Asian American artists, while also forging and maintaining relationships with the community, what I wanted to do um, in Enameable was to present how particular Asian American artists set up the conditions for new subjectivities and other marginalized voices to be part of a larger conversation, be it about Asian American art, the Vietnam War, neoliberalism, or abolition. On another level, I was really interested in how Yoko Ono, Te Ching She, and I have a lot of work by Te Ching She, Simon Leung, Byron Kim, and others serve as cultural laborers in which they seemingly create nothing. This is a painting, but here, he, he did this piece right here um, at the Whitney Philip Morris, which the material was basically um, uh, the uh, stuff in the vacuum bag. So it was in uh, these cleaners were cleaning the offices and he used that material um, in the bag, which was, you know, dust and dirt and he used that as um as his material to paint the walls of the of, of the um the gallery at the Winnie Philip Morris. And that these kinds of works were, you know, they they seemingly create nothing. And I said N-O hyphen T H I N G because they can't be bought or possessed or from a piece of property. But really I wanted to, you know, see how their art making is relational and tactical in the form of an aesthetic education that ref refigures Asian American art, not as political art, but as an oppositional practice, less in terms of its aspirations to be seen and more in terms of how it models a different way of seeing and encountering the world. I wanted to show their work, how their work highlights how art is formed by a relationship between the self and others, constituted out of the continual and mutual imbrication between the reality of material conditions and a mortal sense of the world. So following the cues and tactics of the artists, I suggested towards the end of the book to for I suggested to curators and scholars to hold off on the quick impulse to claim works such as those by Tetsuke um, as Asian American, not at all to deny sort of the circumstances of the formal making of the work, but to avoid circumscribing and burdening the work with a ready-made set of interpretations already embedded in a viewer's purview or imagination. Um, I wanted to avoid foreclosing alternative and iterative presentations of the work. While I understand, well, I understood then, and I understand now that to note that no name can describe fully what a work of art is doing or evoking, to name and claim a work of art as Asian American. I don't know, arguably, uh, when I wrote the book, I thought would impede the momentum of an ongoing unknowable encounter and undercut the possibility of a politics already underway rather than pushing it forward. So the book was published a couple of years ago, but I still stand by 
the need to approach Asian American art as not just as a set of objects, but as a set of practices, tactics, aesthetics, and poetics that unsettle orders and hierarchies and create the conditions for new relationships, practices, and communities. And as implied in the book, you know, artists are kind of already doing this work. And I realized have been doing it for a long time. Thinking of the long game, offering models to protect themselves by creating and maintaining safe spaces. Okay, maybe this is a good way. This and now I see and look away. Okay, I'm just gonna talk and then it's a good way because it's all about opacity. So following Edward Glissant's call for a right to opacity, which he first mentioned in 1981, and again in Poetics of Relation published in 1990, Artists such as Stephanie Sutrico and uh, Gina Osterlo take up this claim and practice it. And I realized I did not put the title here either. This is Stephanie Sutrico's Blocking the Sun. And um, this is a piece um, in which she went to the Smithsonian, the archive, the National Archives, and she um, uh, was checking at the archives of the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. And there, the St. Louis World's Fair was really known for their, this Philippine village. Um, uh, that was uh, organized by William Taft. And uh, they're like all colonial ethnographic photographs, very exploitative. And she writes how um, that basically, this is in her words, by physically blocking the image with my hands, I attempted a direct way of intervening with an archive and thwarting the viewer's ability to fully consume the people and faces on display. Over a century after the original photos of the Filipino village were taken, my own body sitting in the archives became both a temporary shield and a market of defiance, while at the same time acknowledging that the images still remain. So a number of these artists, you know, they're, they're claiming the right to opacity by covering over things, turning around, making things a blur, you know, and things usually when think, people think a blur is really, um, sort of a negative thing, but especially now because I have this eye patch on my eye, I want to think about, you know, blurring as um, this, uh, as a site of sort of agitation of, of inscrutability. This is Gina Osterler's Looking Back. Um, I, I accepted your invitation to her athleticism in which she plays a lot with photography in different kinds of ways. And here she is with camouflage and she writes, this was one of the first visual strategies I employed, quote, to address simultaneous experiences of passing and not passing, a reality of mixed race identity. I'm also interested in color, pattern and mimesis, the act of copying as well as repetition to bend and play with perception. So what does it mean to claim for the right to, you know, for opacity? And I was thinking about these artists who have been doing this work for a really long time and how they're protecting themselves, but also presenting the work in a way that follows Vivian Huang's recent monograph on surface tensions and inscrutability, because they engage in an act of resistance and refusal. They engage in an act of refusal to be transparent and or to put on display their victimhood and trauma. And by the way, there's a, there was a great exhibition that actually Stephanie was in recently at the Guggenheim called Going Dark. Um, and the contemporary figure at the edge of visibility. And it was really, it was, it was fantastic because it was about the desire to be hidden and to be visible on the artist's own terms. But within Glissant's concept of opacity is also a call for being with difference. Being with difference being in relationality, which is both an empowering tactic and also an ethical task. Artists are already engaged in this work of world making and envisioning the world in wild, cosmological, speculative and ethical ways in and through um, a number of, 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 of you know, pathways and systems. And I, I want to know how might curators play a role in taking on this text? We can't just depend on artists to do all the work. We as curators and art historians need to cultivate and carefully tend the conditions laid out by these artists. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really interested is, you know, like, is it possible, you know, I, I, I just really want to, so in this exhibition that I'm co-curating with my friend Amy Sadow, we really want to push the envelope. 
and approach one curating as caregiving rather than caretaking as truly one of repair, repairing severed formal aesthetic histories as well as forgotten histories of solidarities, for, solidarities, for example, between Vietnam and Palestine. But two, we want to also really sort of rethink Asian American art and how might we revi revive it as a mode of resistance, resilience, and reckoning. What would it mean to mobilize Asian American art in relationality, in relation, for example, to the larger project of abolition and sovereignty, borrowing from the, in terms of the form of when I talk about abolition from Angela Davis's writing on abolition and democracy, right? which points at how the current situation is harmful and carceral. And um, she defines abolition and democracy as meaning you know, that who participate in political life need to change how democracy functions and what alternatives can become possible as a result. And so I want to, you know, think about her words when you think about both abolition democracy, but also thinking about sovereignty, uh, sorry, not sovereignty. I want to think about sovereignty, but also settler colonialism. Um, in correspondence with scholarship and Asian American studies on settler colonialism, how might we take into consider consideration our positionality as settlers of color? And how does that impact the way we curate and write about Asian American art? In correspondence with the aftermath of Black Lives Matter and abolitionist thinking that highlight the long history and structure of the carceral state that infiltrates every aspect of our lives, not just Black lives, how might we approach the exhibition as a space to juxtapose works that sort of cultivate our senses and be attuned to other ways of knowing the world? So I wanna end here with um, a work by Gay Chin, who is a Pacific Islander artist. Um, and one of the things she has is this thing called, um, it's called Movable Feast, but it's also part of a larger project called Eating in Public. It was founded in 2003 in Hawaii. Um, and she writes how it's this Eating in Public is, is a move to sort of nudge a little space outside of the state and capitalist systems. Following the path of pirates and nomads, hunters and gatherers, diggers and levelers, we gather at people's homes, plant free food gardens on private and public land, set up free sto stores and other autonomous systems of exchange, generally without permission. Unlike Santa and the state, we give equally to the naughty and the nice. We do not exploit anyone's labor nor offer any tax reductions. We are in the world's, we are in the world's various definitions free. So, how might we consider relationality in the ways that Gay Chan and Nandita Sharma have done? Asian American art has been about creating safe spaces, expressing identities and experience, and narrating Asian American history. How might we see it as revealing other interconnected histories, amplifying submerged voices, and serving as a re reparative space for others? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Min, for that insightful talk, not only on the importance of Asian American art, but also its complexities in terms of interpretations and framing as well. And now I would like to open up the floor for our Q&A session. So feel free, guys, to either unmute or type your questions in the chat, and I can then read them out for you. So I can give you guys a moment for that. Okay, we have a question. So this, this is to Dr. Min. What piece of Asian American art affected you personally the most? Justin, that is a really hard question. <laughs> um, there are a number of um, works of art that have really um, impacted me. Um, I think, I guess the first one would be, I would say, wow. It's interesting. I mean, I don't know, later on, maybe Mark, we could talk about a trajectory um, in terms of how we got to Asian American art. You had mentioned it in terms of your coming to um, San Francisco Art Institute and working with Carlos Villa. Um, for me, I would say it was first actually Teresa Hakyang Cha's Dicte, 
Um, I had read it in a literature class. And I first, when I, I don't, I don't know if you guys have read it in class for, for, for this particular class or another one, um, but it was really difficult and challenging. And it was like, what is this? And then um, I read it again and again and again. And then I saw her videos and I think really that was the first work that really moved me. But, um, you know, I I would say also touching Shea's um, performance pieces, which I showed very briefly. I, I'm sorry, I went by the slides really fast. I just realized that because I'm like, oh, it's 7-Eleven. I kind of like went through, I went by <laughs> really um, talked way too fast and showed the slides too fast. But I think touching Shea's performances also, um, his one-year performance is also really... I think um, changed the way um, I could see the possibilities of what art can do. Can I involve Mark too in the conversation? Mark, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> so I, I, I love your answers and I'm just gonna say for everybody you know, the Taiching Shea slide was the image of this guy tied with a rope to a woman. And the woman was performance artist Linda Montano, and they lived together, tied together with an eight foot rope. They didn't know each other. They weren't a couple or anything like that. And just as a performance art piece, uh, the kind of study in commitment really to you know go through this you know intense experience and everything that you can imagine um, when you didn't really know the person um, but just as a commitment to art uh, he did all kinds of amazing uh, one-year performances like punching a time clock every hour on the hour for a year which means that you have to, you can't sleep for more than 58 minutes or whatever it is, you know, this incredible commitment to art. So I, I agree, this is, um, it's uh, it's sort of an inconceivable kind of artwork. And for me, I also wanted to just say, uh, one of the things that have been most impactful, I think are the things that are the hardest for me um, to learn about. And so for instance, some of those uh, Chinese American artists that I was mentioning, all the scholarship, all the writing about them is in Chinese. Well, there's a really old community here that supports uh, with Chinese language press. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's harder to learn about. And then somebody who is so like that, Zhang Dachen, who is so steeped in, uh, you know, a completely different visual language that was not really part of my background. So, um, you know, it's to even think about it, I have to kind of re-educate myself uh, so that I can, if I'm going to, you know, talk about the work or put it in an exhibition or something like that, to have some kind of a perspective on actually what I think the work is doing. Um, and so that's really, uh, you know, not easy and represents, you know, that kind of years of immersion to try to figure something out. Yeah, I wanted just to also just add that, um, you know, in terms of time, touching shifts work really challenged and question my, the sense of time. Um, and then with Teresa Cha, it was about space and history and memory and the transnational. Um, and one of the things I guess in terms of both their works, but any artworks um, is in the sort of example that you gave Mark um, is thinking of work that really resonates with you where you remember it and you can't get it out of your mind and you wanna learn more and more and you wanna read more. That's, you know, um, this is, you know, these two artists really um, have just not hot, I guess haunted me that you know they've they've been with me their works um I remember them and um they've just become part of you know the way I I want I approach art, art in general um but it also even though I just mentioned them if you asked me like next week this same question Justin I might answer it differently <laughs> so just wanted to make that note <laughs> All right, we have another question. This one is from Dr. Bond. Are there any current Asian American artists that you are following that are also inspiring to other young Asian American artists? Mark, 
Mark, do you want to answer that or do you want me to do that? Young Asian American artists. Well, uh, you know, it, there's there's uh, kind of a super abundance. And so it's like, um, you know, because I'm somebody who's really committed to this sort of um, uh, memory and, you know, remembering the people who have been forgotten. Uh, one reason that I'm interested in that is because it enables us to see connections over time. Uh, Masako Miki is a Berkeley-based artist who is a sculptor whose work is playful and colorful, but it connects for me back to Noguchi so I can see these artists in dialogue. Jennifer Wofford is someone who has made really a, a kind of a, a radical commitment to uh, to Filipina American artist uh, to our Bay Area landscape and really extending the work that Carlos Villa did. Um, so, you know, these are all really, ex I, and I can, you know, stop, <laughs> I can go on for a long time. Uh, uh, there's um, Li Hua Yi is a San Francisco ink painter. who's was maybe, you know, one of the most successful artists in the Bay Area, but again, because his audience is in, the Chinese language community, he's he's not so much, you know, embraced. Uh, you know, I'll say, uh, when I taught at Humboldt, um, I was so interested because uh, just as Suzette is talking about different alliances and connections, there was a really strong Native American art community there and uh, they put on exhibitions of indigenous artists and they invited Hmong people to exhibit with the native artists. And it made for such an interesting kind of uh, mix because you'd have the basket weavers from the Indian community, uh, working with the textile artists from the Hmong community. Um, so, you know, great uh, kind of intersectional connections uh, that I find inspiring. Yeah, there's there's so many artists. I mean, there's Gina Osterla, who I should very briefly, who, you know, um, uses camouflage and sort of turning away from the camera. And she plays a lot with figuration and abstraction, I think, in in really fantastic ways. And she and it and um, she's uh, been noticed and recognized. She got a, um, a Guggenheim recently or I think uh, two days ago. Um, and uh, let me there's just so many right now. I can't I'm like, wow, you know. I just, just like lists a bunch of names, but I don't know if that would mean anything. But um, one of the things I, I, I think that's really interesting is that um, a number of the artists from the 1990s are now professors um, in museums. And like, for example, in the case of Gina Osterlo, Simon Leung was his teacher, or was her teacher, was his teacher, was her teacher, for, sorry, at UC, UC Irvine. He's a conceptual artist. Um, and he inspired, and he's, you know, really, um, uh, both inspired and cultivated a number of interesting artists. Young Su Min was also at UC Irvine, and she also inspired a number of Korean American artists um, who focus on the Korean diaspora and transnationalism. And um, she recently passed away um, uh, a month ago. Um, yeah, you know what? Come to my exhibition in 20, 25, 26. <laughs> And you'll see a number of interesting artists who I think are not only impacting um, the direction of Asian American art, but they've also been influenced by also other, you know, other older Asian American artists, including, for example, Carlos Villa and Leah Valador, you know, artists that um, have been underrecognized for far too long. Um, Leah Valador, I am certain, will have an exhibition soon, I hope. Um, and so, um, yeah. But, you know, if um, Dulcie, is it Daisy? Daisy and Justin, if you ever have, you know, um, artists that you are interested in, please do not hesitate to email us and we can definitely share a list um, and links to them. Actually, that was Jenny or Jenny. I can email them to you and Alex. Um, sorry, I cannot read. I cannot read the chat. So Justin, oh. go, go ahead, Kavina. You can read it. You can go ahead. You can go ahead. Uh, th th that message actually was from Sarah Vu. <laughs> uh, so this message is uh, from Debbie uh, 
already do this one? Not, not yet. Justin asks, to both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Min, uh, which piece of Asian American art on particular artists do you believe to be most influential in the development of getting it into the mainstream? Or Justin, maybe you could read it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll jump in. I understand what your question is. And just to say, you know, getting mainstream attention is uh is a you know, is is kind of a weird uh you know part of the art world because you know, mainstream attention generally means um you know somebody's that's you know in one of the biggest art capitals uh that uh is affiliated with the curators at the biggest museum so that they collect the work and then it gets into the books and that's the mainstream and let me tell you there's been not so many in asian american art history uh you know i think as i said i think the most famous historical artist is Noguchi. Um, you know, in 1989, I sat with Carlos Villa and other people, and we said, well, if there was going to be an Asian American art history, who would who would be in it? We said, well, there's Noguchi. That was like the one name we thought of first. We said, and there's Kuniyoshi. That was the second name. And then Bill, a friend named Bill Berkson said, my mom had a Don Kingman in the bathroom, and we sort of got stuck. And um, but anyway, so why was Noguchi so successful? Um, uh, he was, um, uh, you know, he was uh, super charismatic. Uh, you know, he collaborated with top people in the New York art scene. Uh, he was a brilliant artist who kind of bridged abstraction and kind of prefigured minimalism. So his work kind of fit what people were looking for. Um, but even Noguchi in 1939, you know, uh, got this, uh, you know, terrible racist review. Um, so, uh, and he hated, he hated the guy who wrote it for the rest of his life. He held a grudge. Uh, so anyway, um, but, you know, even though I really applaud every, uh, I love Noguchi and, you know, I, the, I hope people will visit the Noguchi Museum in New York where, the uh, wonderful show of Toshiko Takaezu is now on display, as Suzette mentioned. But I think I'm more interested in the people who do work to, you know, organize and make an alternative. Suzette talked a lot about these great groups like Godzilla, Kearney Street Workshop. I talked about those earlier groups like uh, the East West Art Society, the Chinese Revolutionary Artists Club. These were people who made a community, made their own exhibitions, uh, wrote their own manifestos, and left an incredible record of uh, commitment to culture uh, in a way that I find um, actually more inspiring. If I wanted, you know, because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my choices were to move to a, a different kind of community, not to try to embed myself in the New York mainstream, but, uh, you know, to work with artists in Northern California. Uh, let's see. So it's interesting because mainstream, I always, I think that word is like, what does that mean in terms of the general public, which I would distinguish that from like the art world, um, or art history or sort of museum world. That said, um, I think one particular artist I would mention would be Yoko Ono. Um, she has name recognition, not only because you know she was married to John Lennon, but um, she is an amazing conceptual artist. And also she's, what I like about her is that she really doesn't fit, she either fits into all these different kinds of categories or she blurs the different categories. Um, or she overlaps them, or she sort of challenges them. So she's been seen as a conceptual artist, a fluxus artist, a feminist artist, an Asian American artist. And she raises the question, so I asked at the beginning, what is Asian American art? What does it do? But a, another question could be, when is art Asian American? Or when is an artist Asian American? So um, it's interesting with Yoko Ono, 
um, Yuyo Kusama, Nam Jun Paik. A number of these artists have actually, for a long time, they were not seen as Asian American art. They were seen as Asian artists or this cosmopolitan artist or Korean artist um, or Japanese artist. And so it's interesting now, and Mark, you can tell you can totally disagree with me about this, but it's been interesting to see how Yoko Ono, Yoyo Kusama, um, not Yoyo Kusama, less Yoko Ono and Nam Jun Paik have been, you know, um, embraces Asian American artists. And Nam Jun Paik is, was incredibly influential. Not maybe he wasn't getting mainstream attention, but he really changed, you know, new media, media arts, video art. He was really influential. Um, he's a groundbreaking figure. And both Yoko Ono and Nam Jun Paik have had, you know, major retrospectives. Um, and I would hope that a lot of people came and that the mainstream came, but um, it's not clear. But I would think those two individuals um, are really, um, you know, people that uh, the general public know. Maybe another artist would be Maya Lin, you know, in terms of her Vietnam Veterans War Memorial. That is an incredibly beautiful, moving piece. Um, she is, you know, right now doing art on climate change and the environment, and they're both installation works, drawing, sculpture, um, and also she does different kinds of commission commissions. But I think the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial is really, um, you know, something that people, it's a touch that people still remember. It's incredible, you know, they go to D.C. to see um, this work. May or maybe they don't. I don't know. Maybe they go to Vietnam Veterans Vietnam Veterans War Memorial and they don't know who made it. It could be that you know they they just don't think about Maya Lin, but I think they do. Am I wrong, Mark? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm gonna say uh, both Suzanne and I have had a lot of experience as curators. So sometimes when you invite someone in to participate in a show, you have to ask them if they are comfortable being included in such a show. So for instance, I had the experience of asking Yoko Ono if she would be in an exhibition of Asian American artists. And she said, sure. So I think that's one answer. Um, but I wanna tell another story, which is when I spoke to Ruth Asawa about having her work in an Asian American art show, she said, well, um, I'm, not Asian, I'm not an Asian American artist. I'm not a woman artist either. I'm just an artist, plain and simple, but I'd be happy to be in the show. So, you know, I think I like Ruth's answer because, um, you know, she didn't want to be pigeonholed as anything. You know, she wanted people just to uh, deal with her work as an individual statement um, and not to, not to be that kind of boxed in. Uh, but, you know, again, she agreed to participate. Uh, Dr. Bond, I just wanted to double check. Uh, do we still have time for more questions? Because I think we have a few more in the chat. Um, yes, actually, um, Dr. Amin, uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson, uh, uh, do uh, do I have your consent to, to get to, I, I always plan, you know, I asked for the three hours, but I was thinking two hours in my mind. Uh, it, do I have your consent to go to 8 p.m. if possible for the, just to answer the rest of the questions? Oh, sure. Okay, great. And uh, Kavina, I think you can maybe read out the questions for them. I, I see a question from uh, Mr. Julian. Yes. So actually, wait, I think I'll Daisy. go for the earlier one, uh, Daisy's question, and then I'll get to Julian's after that. Daisy's, so yeah. We skipped over Daisy's. And oh. Yeah. So Daisy, this is a question for both you, both of you guys. It's, do you feel that COVID-19 has had an impact on Asian American art and what kind of art is being produced now? Yes, I think COVID-19 had a huge impact on all of us and artists. Um, I think uh, on the positive side, um, it slowed down, um, you know, it slowed down, slowed down time. They had more time to be at home in their studio um, to make work. Um, as, you know, artists who um, are part of the gallery system and are on this, you know, once once you get noticed, 
once you get representation, you got to really hustle and make work constantly. And you never know when the next exhibition will be. And so it's constant, like working, you know, making work all the time. And I think sometimes that's really good if you have the passion and you have the energy and you're ready to go and you have a lot of work to show. I think um, for others, uh, it could be a bit too much and you need to sort of slow down, but that's not how the art market and the art world works. Um, I think for others, it was a time just to sort of, you know, do, do work on stuff that they hadn't worked on for a really long time. Um, and then I think on the negative side, it was about time and mortality. And I think, um, it did shift for some artists, um, their relationship and approach to the work. Um, and so it's been interesting to see going to studio residence and see the kinds of work, um, that they're making since COVID, um, and it'll be interesting to see because you know now that work is being displayed now, um, in bits and pieces. So, and so I'll I'll try to answer that um, by saying I think, uh, as Suzette suggests, it impacted all of us and it impacted all artists. And I've heard I, I'm sitting here trying to remember if there was an Asian American artist who did a project that was you know, uh, you know, relating to being kind of confined and, and, and I'm not exactly, you know, coming up with any really good things to share. Certainly many people uh, did things that related to Zoom because that became our new way to connect. I'm, I'm a studio art teacher. And so, you know, teaching studio art on Zoom at San Francisco State, you can imagine is um, sort of some of, I don't know if you guys had that experience, but we did anyway. Uh, but but the other part, the bad part, um, that on a national level, COVID-19 uh, led to uh, a political horrific rise in racism uh, that, you know, political figures would uh, you know, make this a make this about make COVID nineteen about race and ancestry and all the violence and everything that's happened and that has certainly changed. Um, I think a lot of people's practice and a lot of people's mindset and um, so in that way, I think in, in, more specifically for Asian American artists, it did have a um, a, a negative, very a, a hurtful outcome that people are processing in their work. And it wasn't just, it was not just COVID-19 and also the anti-Asian violence, but also it was, you know, the George Floyd murders. I mean, that really, I think also impacted them. Um, and so again, I also cannot think of a work right now, a specific work of art um, made during that time um, that was related to these things, but um, Again, you can see maybe elements of that um, in the work or in at least the process of the work. And one of the things that I have to say I'm, I'm really interested in is really process um, and how they conceptualize the work, sometimes more so than the actual outcome, the actual product or actual you know, work itself. All right. And for our next question from Julian, this is to both Dr. Min and Dr. Johnson. Are you familiar with Stephanie Shi's food ceramics? She has gained popularity through Instagram, YouTube, and other social media platforms, making hyper-realistic ceramics. What are your thoughts on social media and its impact on gaining attention to Asian American art? Does she make the like the cute little like um, buns and stuff? Is that that artist? I believe so, yeah, but I myself am not too sure. And she makes uh, like soy sauce bottles and, you know, this whole kind of display of food stuff. So I'll say, yeah, she's got, you know, uh, she's a wonderful artist, number one, and I've never met her, but I admire her work. But it also reminds me to mention uh, that Asian American have really excelled, made such important contributions in the media of ceramics. 
Uh, and so we talked about Toshiko Takaezu because she's having this uh, major exhibition right now, uh, but it goes back to the 19th century again. Uh, part of the Japonisma, they were inviting Japanese ceramic artists to come and work in the United States. Uh, and, you know, throughout the sort of abstract expressionist period, Henry Takamoto making wonderful ceramics, you know, so yeah, there's a whole great category of fantastic ceramics. They're uh, artists, there's never been a group exhibition of Asian American ceramics. I think it would be really valuable and interesting. Uh, so maybe that's something just you can work on. Um, Anna Suhoi, who curated the Scratching the Moon exhibition is an amazing ceramic artist. Um, and I do want to go back to what you just said, Mark, but I want to also answer, answer the question in terms of social media. And I, I do like, I, if I think of the, I think if I think it's the same artist, then I do like Stephanie, she's work a lot. Um, and I like uh, the fact that it's really about the everyday. And um, I would think actually when you, I can't remember who the question, um, sorry, I can't see the, the chat, the text, but um, the person who asked about the impact of COVID-19, I think the there's a definitely a, a sort of revitalized, re-energized focus on the everyday and the mundane and making it strange or, you know, really sort of, you know, showing the sort of intimate sort of relationship, you know, um, in our, and the way we use everyday objects and interact with people. Um, I think that's important. Um, and I like, I think Stephanie's work is about that. Instagram has been amazing. So my daughter um, is younger and she wanted to be on Instagram and I'm not on any social media, but she was doing Instagram and I was kind of like, eh. So I said, I decided to follow. I was decided to also join Instagram just really to sort of see what she was doing. But then I saw all these artists and their artworks and it was kind of amazing because not only are they showing their artworks, but they're showing their process and they're showing what they see. I think it's actually, as a curator and a scholar, it's an amazing tool um, and resource. Um, and it's been amazing also to uh, promote to themselves because I look, I find, I discover new artists all the time on Instagram. Um, I'm probably sure I probably would find more artists. You guys tell me on not Facebook, I guess that's outmoded, but like, you know, TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but maybe that's also a site I should be looking at. Um, but, you know, websites, uh, Instagram, and like almost every artist has their own web page. It's, it's kind of been an amazing resource, especially, you know, um, you know, if people can't travel and we think of climate change and we really need to sort of, you know, um, cut down on our carbon, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's been, it's been kind of a game changer. Are you on Instagram, Mark? I was going to, I'm smiling to myself because I'm not on any social media. I occasionally look at somebody else's phone to find out, just as you said, you know, what other people's inspiration is. But because my focus is largely the historical, I'm the guy in the library archive <laughs> looking for the things that, you know, might be hidden away in there more than uh, the contemporary uh, cutting edge uh, social media. However, also, you know, artist websites is another incredible way for people to share uh, their work more generally so that uh, people can look up, uh, research what the artist is, you know, the sort of identity that they have constructed for themselves in a, in a complicated way, as well as the uh, process that they share through platforms like Instagram. So one of the questions I had, because one of the things I think um, having an Asian American art exhibition of ceramic works would be amazing. At the same time, I have a little bit of a, not knee jerk reaction, but a little hesitation because why have just all Asian American ceramic art? Why don't we have ceramic and a ceramic art exhibition with BIPOC artists or other artists, not just Asian American? Because one of the things is sort of when you do an Asian American art exhibition and it's all ceramics, like then what's the what's the curatorial thread? Is it just because everyone is Asian American? That's kind of what you know I'm trying to, you know, question, work around, challenge, in some I, way. And I agree, uh, and that's where the you know curatorial process comes in to actually look and identify. But uh, there is. 
you know, and of course it was vast, I think contributions by people from other backgrounds, but there is an incredibly deep root of Asian American ceramics that I think uh, reflects some of the ways in which ceramics is so highly valued in Asia. So there's a kind of a historical legacy that is in part foundational. All right, moving on to next question, which actually I have a question, kind of going on that thread of like curation. So you both mentioned collections or exhibitions. How do you go about selecting artists and pieces for a collection? And like, what's the thought process behind putting something like that together? So I'm somebody who has advised museums on building collections before. And uh, it's interesting to see how um, museums react and how times change. Uh, so I can remember many instances where I was like knocked out by something. It's like, this is so incredible. And it's like the period is so outstanding by mainstream museums. And I gave it my best pitch and people would say, no, I don't think that's a, you know, one of the curators of a you know, prestigious museum said to me, I don't think there's ever gonna be a time when that artist is gonna end up in our museum's collection. 20 years later, they were nuts and they're pursuing it like crazy as, you know, because times change and they realized how important it was and they saw it with completely different eyes. Another museum picked up that piece, but then I pitched to that other museum and another incredible piece that was so obvious to me was a, such an important masterpiece that I thought everybody would go nuts about. And that other museum who had been so receptive to the first artist said, you know, I just don't think that's gonna be a good fit for us. So um, their criteria sometimes includes uh, the media in which the work was painted. They felt maybe, that uh, work painted on silk was not appropriate for their museum collection because it was atypical and they didn't have a scholar that, uh, or a conservator in house that they thought could deal with that kind of thing or they felt it belonged at a different kind of museum as we talked about an Asian art museum if the work you know should maybe be there and not in a modern museum. And so um, uh, building collections take somebody again who is really um, putting in the work, and I really want to recognize again Melissa Ho at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, who's doing an incredible job now building a great collection uh, at our National Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C., uh, that will have very rich um, historical and contemporary material in it. I've also just been an advisor um, in terms of recommending works for collection. I've never worked at a place where there was a, a collection. No, I mean, yeah, I've never worked at a place. Um, uh, and so, you know, one of the things about um, collecting artworks is that it takes a lot of money because you have to preserve it and conserve it. Um, and that is always, you know, something that um, the curators and the mm. The board consider, but also place and sites. The site specificity of the place is really important to to keep in mind. Um, and there's a tendency to um, go for artworks um, by artists with a name value who are very familiar and already have sort of a very um, you know have a reputation. Um, rather than going for um, artworks that maybe are under-recognized or are or, or by young artists. Um, this is why it's really important. So, it, you know, curators are incredibly important and so are collectors, but so are art historians and critics and writers. So the more people that write about a work that creates sort of discursive right, formation, a discourse about the work, not just, you know, hype, but also a discourse and a history, um, is really, really crucial, um, you know, and then I hope that all of you, you know, are either pr practitioners or future curators or collectors, but also I hope you are also future writers and critics. 
um, because we really, really need, especially in terms of Asian American art, there's so many artists in which their works um, need to be written about. And there's a tendency in a lot of exhibitions to only show one work of art rather than a number of works of art. And that's just sometimes does a disservice both to the artists, the artwork and the show. Um, so anyways, that's sort of my two cents about um, collecting. I don't know, Kavina, did you have another sort of follow-up question or what are the sort of reasons why you asked that question? I just found it interesting because I remember you mentioned it before, like things about framing and how that kind of plays a role in how something is put together. Yeah, thank you for that. And then uh, for our next question, we have, do you think, this is for the both of you, do you think that by labeling an artist as Asian or Asian American, it can diminish the art that they produce? Do you think it impacts the way a person views their art because the label Asian or Asian American has been assigned to it? Yes, unfortunately, sometimes it does. It shouldn't, but sometimes I think um, people come with um, preconceived ideas about um, what Asian American art is or the identity of the artist. Um, and, you know, a lot of times they're, they're stereotypical or they're just ignorant or naive. Um, and ideally, when you look at it and encounter a work of art, um, you kind of just, you know, put those aside and you really engage the work of art and maintain its integrity, right? You're not sort of, you know, I mean, we all of course have, you know, projections and, um, you know, um, again, sort of uh, preconceived ideas of working at the art, but ideally those kind of move away and you really look at the art for what it is, what it's offering, and then that encounter that experience. And then also how it's, you know, juxtaposed and with other works of art. And, you know, in terms of then you think about the theme of the exhibition or the context, um, ideally, you know, there's sort of a multi-layered encounter when you're, you know, um, experiencing a work of art, but sometimes um, that label gets in the way. Um, and then there's a tendency a lot of times in Asian American art exhibitions and BIPOC exhibitions to like put so much text um, that um, more often than not overdetermine the work. Um, some text is really important because it gives context. So for example, if there's a work about the Vietnam War, but the work doesn't look like about the Vietnam War. And sometimes, you know, a lot of people don't know about the Vietnam War, especially for example, that the date April 25th, 1975 means something, then sometimes it's good to have it, but it really depends because sometimes it can interfere. And so it's been interesting to see the different kind of curatorial strategies that people have been using. I cannot stand QR codes, but there is something to be said about that. Um, or having the audio tour or having a brochure. And so where you're just really looking at the work for what it is and then reading the you know text or listening to something out elsewhere. And then so how that then informs your reading again. But I can go on and on about this. I'm, I have wrote a whole book about this. So anyways, I'll stop. And I'll just uh, agree uh, and say, of course, what one, nobody wants to be stereotyped and nobody wants to be, read at just face value and especially an artist who puts their heart and soul into what they make uh and their mind you want to be able to as a viewer engage heart and soul and mind and uh at the same time uh i do think um you know we watched what happened we watched what happened where you know uh a century and a half was made invisible by neglect so I think it's important to um, recognize and, uh, you know, and again, sort of celebrate uh, uh, diversity in the arts in all forms. Um, because if it's just the market system, which is, you know, that I mean, that's how things typically work. You know, Suzette was talking about, yes, there's, it, things are much so much better now where there's writers and, uh, but still, um, you know, the, the museums that are supported by gifts from wealthy collectors, you know, typically, uh, you know, I'll just say when SF MoMA reopened with a spectacular new building and it featured the collection of uh, one, you know, the Gap family, which was largely a Euro-American 
uh, you know, collection. So even though the museum was expanded incredibly in a beautiful building, um, it's not like when it first opened, um, it reflected a broader uh, perspective. And now the museum, of course, has worked tremendously to try to uh, incorporate a, a richer and broader perspective in the works that they display. Can I just add one thing though? So I feel like your generation, but also a number of artists that are working today, um, some of them are very, their work is very informed by their, their, their history, their ethnicity, their race, and they foreground that. And so I don't want to give you the idea that, you know, you shouldn't be proud of, you know, who you are, where you're from. Um, and if you're like engaging particular kinds of traditions and appropriating them and sort of, you know, deforming them and interesting, I think you should, you know, definitely as an artist, you know, talk about that. Um, especially if you really, cause you know, you, you want the art, you know, the viewer to, um, have that understanding of your work, that intentionality, and then that work should be, that, that context should be foregrounded. And we have another question that I accidentally skipped over before. So this is again for the both of you. What are some barriers that Asian American artists have faced in the past that are still being faced today? There are many, I mean, there's still a lot of racism. Um, there's a lot of presumptions about, you know, again, the identity of the artist or the artwork. Um, uh, Orientalism. Um, there's also, uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes prestige or, you know, who you know, um, or where you went to school um sometimes comes into play um did i list them all i don't know there are just a lot of things uh, I, think, I would agree with that i'm going to add just one thing which always struck me uh when we were working to uh doc you know back in the 90s when we started research to try to create a kind of biographical directory of artists of Asian ancestry uh, working in California, uh, we d created files on the work of 1,200 artists who were active before 1965. So it was a pretty vast group. And from that, we decided to profile about 150 of them in a biographical directory project. So we were going over who we would include and we kind of came up with the list of the 150 that was pulled out of the list of 1,200. And then we were saying, well, what, what, what do we find that's similar and that happened to multiple uh, multiple members of this coterie of artists that were in the past. I said, well, it's kind of striking that three of them were blinded in one eye in a racist mugging. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 I hadn't imagined that I would find that, uh, but uh, Nobuo Kitagawa and, uh, Gary Wu, uh, and I'll think of the third one in a minute, you know, um, you know, that's, you know, part of their biography, but they were, you know, survivors. Ruth Asawa got an honorary doctorate from San Francisco State. And uh, she said, I'm getting this in part because I did this public art piece on, on the campus and it was about the internment, but I just wanna say one thing, we are not victims. We are survivors and we are success stories. <laughs> so it was a great speech. She got a standing ovation, uh, but there was, you know, she was sent to the internment camp. I mean, there was really, really explicit racist uh, situations that many people in the past have felt. And, you know, my worry is that, you know, sometimes those things tick up and I hope we are not moving into that kind of moment again. Yeah. And sometimes there are just um, overriding trends. Um, and always, you know, I want to say there's these different degrees of racism um, or microaggression. I'm thinking about someone like Leah Mino, who is working with plastics, you know, um, and was an artist ahead of his time. But at the time, 
he was kind of creating work that didn't fit, for example, um, in this case, you know, um, in relation to what Donald Judd was talking of, you know, his his focus. Um, or there's, you know, an emphasis on, there's a really, a, you know, both in terms of the market, in terms of art history, an interest in figurative painting, and you're doing abstraction painting, you know, and so people just sort of ignore you and, you know, it, but you still need to, if that's what you do, that you need to keep working on that and, 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 and keep moving, but that sometimes people overlook, um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of, a number of abstract, um, abstract a lot of artists who did abstract art, who I think were were ignored for a really long time because their work didn't look um, anything about identity. It wasn't about social justice. It wasn't about race, you know. And so people sort of just ignored them, which was incredibly unfortunate. But hopefully, they're being recognized now. I read this wonderful interview uh, in today's. Uh, I think I, just, I started reading the art journal about Stanley Whitney, who is a wonderful abstract artist who's having his first solo museum show, kind of retrospective look at the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo. He's 77 years old. He's such a great artist. Many people have loved his work for a long, long time. If you see it, it's rich, rich color, but you know, it's just, he didn't really fit any, into any box. And so now he's 77, he's finally getting this big museum show in Buffalo. So uh, I think that's what you mean. You know, it's just like he was, you know, he was, he was kind of a solo character. Yeah. I mean, another example would be like, you know, in terms of um, Southeast Asian, especially Vietnam, Vietnamese American artists, where they, there's an expectation that their work has to be about the war. But that's not so, um, you know, but there is sometimes a tendency, I think, especially in um, both Asian American art exhibitions and other kinds of exhibitions where there is a tendency just to choose work by artists who, you know, engage some aspect of the war. Yeah. Um, which is, again, can be detracting and not, you know, another way of being ignored and forgotten or not seen. One, yeah, one reason I'm so happy to have this conversation is to remember all these great people where, uh, where, where uh, I had an aunt who once said, uh, you know, whatever exists will be there forever in time. So we're like touching base with these people who will be forever in time. The great Vietnamese... American artist went back to Vietnam, Din Le just passed away, I think at oh, the age of 50. Uh, so, you know, he did make work about the war, but he made work about many things uh, and was a, a, the, that kind of person, you know, that I was saying that I admire so much for building community. Uh, so. Yeah, that was a huge loss. And we will end the Q&A with just one last question. And uh, to whoever read this, please feel free to step in and clarify things. I don't know if I'm interpreting it correctly. But the question is, uh, Asian American artists, they've gone through like milestone lenses, such as like a sociological lens, a psychological lens, philosophical, anthropological, and theological aspects. And which of these lenses do you often see that um, this art is expressed in, in an incredible way. So I'm sorry, that's a bit confusing. I don't think I'm interpreting the question correctly, so. So I'm just gonna jump in and say, you know, how wonderful to use, you know, many different lenses to uh, approach the work. Uh, today, we haven't talked so much about theological, but a spiritual lens, I think, is the inspiration for many artists as they create work. Uh, sociological, I haven't seen the exhibition yet, but I'm really excited to go to the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History uh, for an exhibition uh, about uh, the, Filipino migrant workers that's just open there. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which that inspire artists, but also inspire curatorial projects, the way 
uh, people approach the work. Um, psychological. Um, yet anyway, so, and, uh, you know, those are all the things that I think inspire artists and can inspire exhibitions. Which of them is, do we see the most of? Um, I don't know, but uh, I think we look forward to seeing the work that your generation creates and what lens you will use to create it with. Um, I would just like add that, you know, um, I think there is a lot of work who, there's a lot of work that is being produced and that has been created that um, can be seen through a number of these lenses. Um, and uh, going back to the idea of, uh, or going back to the topic of curating and framing, it's really important to know that there's not only one way of framing a work of art. There are multiple points of entry into a work of art and there are multiple ways of looking at the art, depending on the context, um, the time, the period. Um, and you know, this is what you know, great art is all about. It's, it resonates with you on multiple levels. And um, I feel, I'm not exactly sure if you want us to name an artist, but I, I'd like to think that a number of the artists that I'm really interested in are not only, um, engaged in world building, but also enabling us to imagine the world in, in a way that we just, you know, people like me can't, I, I can't, you know, I need artists. They're so important in helping me um, imagine otherwise. Um, so. All right, and with that, that ends our Q&A session. So once again, thank you so much to Dr. Min and Dr. Johnson for giving us this talk on Asian American art. And do you have any further comments you would like to give, like artists to follow, things to check out, or anything like that? Um, Jenny, can you just uh, share our emails and um, you know, please continue to send questions. And if there, you know, artists that you do, you're kind of you 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 want to um, ask about, please do. Or we can give you a list of artists, which there would be many. Um, be prepared if yeah. you ask that question. <laughs> yes. Um, any any questions from? Uh, I will send them towards you. Yes. Thank you. These are excellent questions. Can I think this is great. Thank you so much, everyone. And staying so late. <laughs> Thank you. Our, our class is six to nine. So it's, it's just normal fine for us. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one last thing to highlight to our class is that we do have the Dr. Howard and Dr. Ng Academic Excellence ASAM Award, which we're currently crowdfunding for. So consider donating to that. I will paste the link in the chat below. And there's only 12 days left for that uh, crowdsource. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Min. Uh, this was a great honor for our class and a wonderful treat. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Have a good